Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. The first principle of René Descartes' philosophy. It's also one of the first things I learnt when I started studying philosophy at university. I think, therefore I am. And honestly, my first reaction to it was, of course I think. Mm -hmm. But then I thought about it a bit more. And I took it away and I, dis uh, and I considered it. And it came down to the idea and to the very sensible thing of getting things down to base principles. What it's his base point defines a human. Defines a person, defines an individual. I think, therefore I am. Thinking doesn't necessarily mean problem solving, because we can think about lots of things that we can't solve, and think about lots of things which aren't problems. The difference is thinking. Thinking long term? Squirrels do that. They bury nuts for them to find, you know, for, to store them for winter. So, not even that long-term thinking and planning is really something which sets humans apart. But thinking, for the sake of thinking, well, I never discount it as a possibility for animals, especially dogs. You all know my perspectives on my fluffy research assistants. Pretty much that, it, it, you know, if I have to pick between them and humans, I pick them every single time. But... I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. It's kind of an interesting point to start getting into when we're talking about ships which are a feature of the Juno Cole, which is all about thinking and going down a perfectly logical but actually philistic path. They went down a path which was this is the current scenario and this is the solution for it without presuming what the other side would do. It's a very logical scenario thinking form point to go through. But it's a logic which is entirely one sided which is why it becomes a logical fallacy. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Life is not always, and I say this with love in my heart for the world, but life is not always straightforward. It can't afford to be. Because life at its base point involves humans. And humans are rarely if ever straightforward. Because this is where the thinking really comes in. Many things are capable of thinking A to B. Straight line. When you're dealing with a computer, it deals with so many straight lines so quickly, it can look like it can thicken a curve. But really, it's a series of almost infinitesimal number of straight lines. And this is what we're looking at, because there is a difference between thinking in a curve and thinking in an infinitesimal number of straight lines. 
this is where we get to with the naval race, etc. Again, I, I've talked about this in other videos when we're talking about these cruisers. Next year, during the year of design technology, I that's what I'm loosely theming next year. This year was the year of the cruiser. Year after that will probably be the year of. I'm not sure. I'm tempted to do the year of the frigate, but we'll we'll, we'll see. Well, the thing is, you get a lot of straight lines being fought through. And the naval race is not about straight lines. It's a higgledy-piggledy curve. The vessel which really kicks off the naval race is this, the Italia. It's part of the Italian build-up, and the Italians are building up a fleet. Why? To extent, because of the Austro-Hungarians, but also the French, but mostly it's about their own independence and asserting themselves as a unified nation. As a modern nation. As a nation of standing. And because of this, France responds by building ships as well. And as mentioned in other videos, Russia is also building up. And various reasons. America, thanks to Mahan, Roosevelt and friends, also get swapped up in it. And then Britain, of course, joins in because they can't not. And Germany jumps as well. We have this curiously abridged version of a naval race we think about in terms of development of navies where everyone looks at Britain versus Germany roughly 1905 to 1914 and go there you go there's a naval race and that leads to World War One yeah it's not naval race in 1914 is 20 plus years, 20, nearly 30 years old. Because, honestly, the starting gun, putting the starting gun back at 1880 is probably wrong. You probably have to go back to 1870, in the 1870s for when this sort of really starts to develop. And you could go even further. You could go back to the Anglo-Franco Anglo ironclad competition over Warrior and Guar. But the French go, yeah, we're building the Gloire. Let's go. Yeah. We're going to churn out the warrior. And that's going to be better than your ship. And we're going to build it quicker. And it's going to be superior in every single way. And just going to make you look like idiots. This is a problem. This is a problem for pretty much everyone. But the fact is, the naval race is just what's going on. And the Juno cult and the other letters, pieces of thinking going on around this period are attempts to make straight lines out of curves. Their attempt to simplify what's going on. Their attempt to provide an easy answer. And this is why you end up with ships like this. This is why you end up with ships like this. The French cruisers by 1890 are kind of a forerunner for the world in the 1920s and 30s. When you're not allowed to build capital ships and you're really not building battleships, your cruisers start to get really important. And honestly, they start to remind me of the glorious heritage class. Now, that sounds strange. What am I? What am I talking about? I'm talking about a ship. Well, that's of course 
Andromeda Ascendant, the whole Glorious Heritage videos which I've done, and I've been going back and looking through some of the sci-fi videos recently, just to remind myself of what we sort of discussed in them. And one of the factors that came through quite heavily when I was working and developing though that episode and that sort of video was the fact that each of these ships, despite belonging to the same class, was really an individual. Where the designer poured in as much artistry and as much of their personality as they could because this was the culmination of a life's work to build something of this status, this magnificence. And this made me think especially when I'm looking at these 19th century cruisers. The British churn out 29 second class protected cruisers. 29. And they really do churn them out. They're mostly built within a couple of years. Apollo class, Astrea class combined are 29 vessels. And they are as close as you can at the time build, damn near identical. That's a major feat of engineering, that's also a major feat of control, but it's something you can do because they are second class protected cruisers. Ain't nobody gonna uh, nobody going to obsess with turning those into personal images. And in the Royal Navy, especially not, because the Royal Navy is building battleships, first class and second class. And those get all the lovely, glorious stuff, and then there's some first class cruisers as well. They'll get a fair amount of attention, but the second class cruisers? Well, they're... <laughs> they're fourth down on the list. They might as well be machine copies. Yet... France, all their cruisers, all their cruisers in the 1890s and leading up to the 1900s are these, even later in the interwar period, etc. These ships are their ships. They're their symbols. They're the highest status unit you're going to build. You pour your heart and soul into it. Everything's going to have a flourish. Everything's going to be to your exacting aesthetic. This ship here, look at it. It's got sweeping lines. I might be sitting here looking at it thinking this thing looks like a pile of... Mm. But I also can acknowledge it's got beautiful lines. When we consider the design of this class, of the Descartes class, they have two files. They have all of these guns. And I have to admit, the guns are very interesting. And please don't read the design too much because it lists them as 6.3 inch guns, I think. Well, they're actually 6.48 inch guns. Um, it is It is going to be a feature of the next year that I am going to, at some point, I'm, I'm working out how I'm going to do it, whether it's going to be a live one of the ones I suggest myself and put in for when I can, or whether it's going to be a recorded video on a Tuesday. I'm going to go through French gun manufacturer, manufacture, and especially this period, and how they end up with something which is 164.7 millimeters, or 6.48 inch guns. And well, you can tell where they get the 100 millimeter, the 3.9 inch gun from. That's, that makes perfect sense. 100 millimeters. That's per, that's a perfectly round number for a nation which is by this point obsessed with millimetres and scientific measuring and you expect different
They are ships which are designed for the Italian and German naval fleets. They're designed for colonial duties. They are designed to cover all sorts of things. And the fact is, one of them, Pascal, will spend most of her career in French Indochina, where she's active. But the fact is, there's also a problem with these ships being built so individually, with them being built so status-wise, because maintenance of them is an absolute nightmare. Again, the Royal Navy does have an infrastructure advantage, and it's an infrastructure advantage which you might not necessarily consider one. But they have quite good internal communications. And the naval constructors will get around the shipyards. And if a shipyard is um, going off on a tangent because it looks beautiful, or no, this is the coming thing, but is going to cause an absolute logistical nightmare because it's going to make a ship an individual unit rather than part of a class, there will be a constructor there very quickly to go, Hello. We see you. We hear you. We understand you. But we do not care about you. You are not special. This ship is not special. It's going to be one of the fleet. Get over yourself and get the ship built to spec. In France... And... This is one of the reasons why... I do like sort of the Descartes class as a sort of starting point. It's cogito ego sum. It's I think therefore I am and it's I think therefore I can argue. And they will listen to your arguments on these ships. They are constantly trying to innovate. They are constantly trying to make something better than what they've had. And this is the point you have one class one of the ships of the class is named after a philosopher, the other one is named after a famous mathematician. I know Pascal's a bit of a philosopher as well, but let's be honest. He's a mathematician. His most significant works were in maths. He's an interesting soul. Him and Descartes are an interesting pairing. And it's an interesting group to put together. 4,005 tons, theoretically. The maths doesn't work out always quite exactly, and frankly, I think between the ships there is a, a fairly <clears throat> decent fluctuation in that whilst their cart is theoretically 4,005 tons and Pascal is theoretically 4,005 tons, I am fairly certain neither are anywhere near 4,005 tons. <laughs> 16 water tube boilers supplied by two triple expansion engines to drive two shafts with 8,300 indicated horsepower for a top speed of 19 knots or a range of 5,500 nautical miles at 10 knots. Fairly decent. Four, as I said, of those larger guns mounted in a sort of central battery configuration but casemate central battery 10 3.9 inch guns 8 1.9 inch guns 4 1.5 inch guns 2 14 inch torpedoes between 20 and 4 millimeters of deck armor conning tower of 80 millimeters and gun shields of 54 millimeters if you're sitting here thinking alex you were talking about the apollo class cruisers the other day and they're built at not a dissimilar time, and yet there's part of me which thinks that they might actually be able to take this ship in a fight. You're not wrong. 
Honestly, when I was looking at a Descartes class and comparing the notes to the Apollo class cruisers, I was going, hmm, this, this doesn't seem, uh, this doesn't seem um, necessarily sensible. Yes, they have four 6.48 inch guns, but they have a broadside of roughly two of those guns, so broadside matches in. Uh, the 3.9 inch guns, well, 4.7 inch guns, yeah, they can outdone with those broadsides. But the Apollos actually have armor. And they're a second class protector cruiser, yet the Descartes, well, they're protected cruisers. But whether they are second or first class protected cruisers is in very interesting debate that takes place in France. I would certainly put them in the second class category. But the problem with that is, as a rule, France isn't producing enough ships to fit them in the second class category. And they're grouping all these ships together. These ships were authorised on 22nd November 1890 by the Super the Superior Council. It was aimed to not provide a simple parity, i.e. a two power level, the equivalent of the French two power agreement with the Italian and German fleets, but to provide numerical superiority. Their plan was to build 24 new battleships and a total of 70 cruisers. Things don't really go that well. And as I've mentioned before, Jeune Nicole is pushing for fleets based on squadrons of torpedo boats rather than expensive fleets of battleships and they want some cruisers for some duties and all sorts of things and there is a constant debate going on in France and a constant thought process. We don't actually have a picture of Descartes the ship. We don't. So here is Descartes the philosopher. Thought you would enjoy it as a bit of a well thrown in there. The car has an interesting service history, which does not directly relate to the fact that she does look like she is named for a guy who has better hair than my poodle. Actually, comparison up. Do we think the car has better hair than you do? Do we? You think you have better hair. That's fine. So, the car is built by Ateliers et Chantiers de la Loire in Nantes. She's ordered in August 1892. Her keel's laid down, and in like, in sort of 1893, January 1893. She's launched in September 1894 and completes fitting out and moves to Brest in February 1896. She's actually commissioned. On the uh, for sea trials on 12th of February 1896. In August that year, she sails to Cherbourg to be present for the visit of Tsar Nicholas II. Basically, the Russians are coming, they're our big allies, we want to make sure we have our best and newest ships there. If you moved a little bit this way, you could line up with his head and it would look so cool. No, you're not gonna, you're not gonna help at all. You come in here, you demand biscuits and you're no help. I don't know. During her initial trials, when she's not really loaded the bear, she actually reaches a top speed of 21.8 knots. But she suffers stability problems. I can't think why a design which is like this would suffer stability problems. Can you? Anyone? I think has it a guess at what could be causing issues? Uh, 
So she needed ballast to correct that. Um, her funnels were also altered as they were causing actual issues with the ship. Actual issues. In that they were straining on the deck. That's fun. She was then decommissioned at breast for the modifications to be carried out. Uh, she was placed in full commission finally in January 1897. So she takes from, well, let's be honest, they start talking about her in 1891, 1890, and she is not actually commissioned and actually available service properly until 1897. We think well, ships these days are so slow compared to their older ones. No. Ships have always taken a long time. They are complicated beasts. We are confused because in world wars we tend to turn them into churning them out like factory parts. I was reading one shipyard which managed to get, I think it was John Brown and Company, which managed to get destroyer construction in World War One down to almost five months for one vessel. And you sit there and go, oh, wow, that's that's amazing. But then you realise that's their like a hundredth destroyer of World War Two, World War One. By that point, they are literally just doing it from muscle memory. They no longer need to think. There is no longer plans or designs or meetings. There is just, turn up and do this. I've done this so many times, I can do this in my sleep. It's amazing how fast you can build ships when they are not complicated designs and you have done so many of them, you are doing it in your sleep. It's pretty much a copy and paste process. But normally ships take time. She is then immediately sent into China. She joined the Bayard, which was an old ironclad, and another protected cruiser, easily, and an unprotected cruiser, which I can only pronounce the name as Eclairu. Okay? It, I'm sure it's not that, but every time I see that name, all I can think of is Eclairu. Okay, so... Please feel free to correct me if I'm getting it wrong, but I doubt I will ever change because the name is actually spelled E-C-L-A-I-R-E-U-R, -E and it merely thinks it's Eclairu. That is what I think when I see it. And it's just fun. So. Along with these ships, of course, including the Eclairu, uh, they were around in 1898 when the Boxer Uprising in Qin China began. And so they were part of the force there. And part of the reinforcements then came out and was Pascal. Yes. Pascal came along. Along with Jean Bart and um, the old friend of this channel, the gay is ruin. It's in fact that um, Jean Bart and Du Gay Truin replace Islay and Eclairu, which I, I find a bit sad because, you know, you Claire was of use. Surely it wasn't just some chocolate on show pastry with some nice cream in it. Surely it was useful. However, in o well, let's put it this way, they didn't stay out there. And whilst John Bart is soon recalled home, it's well it's not until nineteen really oh nineteen oh two, nineteen oh one, when she's recalled home. End of nineteen oh one. In 1902, she's with the North Atlantic Station and serving the cruisers Destre, Suchet and Taj. But in February that year, she's placed into reserve. Remains in there till August 1904. Then she's sent back to the Far East again. While she's voyaging out there, she's escorting and escorted by, to an extent, the destroyers Francisque, Sabra, and Ten Torpedo Boats. 
Always nice to have some extra reinforcements along. She visited Nanking and on the 18th, in company with the Italian cruiser Calabria and the German gunboat SMS Vorwärts, making a point. It's kind of interesting that several of her deployments involve ships from the fleet she was theoretically built to counter. She remains in the Far East in 1907 before heading to the East Indies, based in Madagascar. She returns to France and then serves the Mediterranean Squadron. In 1908, she's used to support the gunnery school. And by 1911, she's part of the Northern Squadron and is assigned to the fishing grounds off Newfoundland. Again, is this a ship you want to be in going around the fishing grounds of Newfoundland? Really? Really? You're braver than I am. In 1912, she's in the Caribbean and remains there till 1916. Uh, by 1914, she's technically considered part of the Division de l'Atlantique, but she's still with the Caribbean. They're finally called home when war sort of begins. And it's a kind of, it's sort of an interesting scenario because she starts in 1912 and theoretically World War One begins in 1914. But she's out there pretty much four years. And it's on 1915, 1916 by the time she gets home. So I can see where the things come in, but she spends most of her time in sort of Mexico, Caribbean area. She's a part of that. She's part of the force which is trying to hunt the Calrouche. We can all be very happy for Descartes that she never finds the Calrouche. And then she patrols the West Indies from 1914 to 1917, where during which she managed to collide with two merchant vessels. A Spanish freighter and a British steamer, the SS Strasmore. She returned home finally, properly in 1917, uh, was placed in reserve in Lorient and decommissioned. Dead, de disarmed, where her guns went off to be used by the French army. Her 100mm guns were used by an anti-submarine patrol vessels and she becomes an mooring hulk replacing the Dupe de Lhomme, another old friend of the channel, in that role. She sold to be broken up in 1921. It's actually a bit of a surprise she survives this long because she has a big problem with Poudre B and the storage of this very potent material aboard her. In fact in 1900 she has a propellant fire aboard her which almost takes out the ship. It doesn't, and she remains on station in the Far East, but that's more down to luck and insanely brave crew. Now, if you have been around this stuff, garden cotton, uh, nitrocellus, all this stuff, it's a strangely sweet smell. I can honestly not really put it in words, but <sighs> imagine the sweetest smelling cotton candy, the really, really sweet stuff, the stuff which basically smells like you're inhaling sugar, but then add a sort of spicy, tangy twist to it. So like you're also inhaling the sharpest most insane chili at the same time. And then make it faint. So it sort of just wafts over you and almost shocks you every time you step on it. And that is getting on for describing what it's like smelling this stuff. It is a really strange experience. And there's a very base point for why it is like this, because it's nitrocellulose, which is basically put in many different versions of alcohol to actually make it 
stabilize in a form that you can use. It's gelatized with alcohol ether, then stabilized with amyl alcohol to produce what is termed a gelatized colloidal substance. This is then pressed into very thin sheets before being cut into flakes to maximize its exposure area to really help the reaction along. Now Poudre B is useful because whilst it's not flashless it is to an extent one of the reduced smoke um, explosives. It's, it's, how do I put this, it's a uh, sometimes called the first practical smokeless gunpowder but I would say it's more less smoky it's a it's it's very fine and very limited smoke it's it's created in 1884 in the Laboratoire Central de Poudres et Salpetres in Paris it's originally named Poudre V because its inventor is Paul Viel and mm -hmm. but it's renamed Poudre B because well Poudre Blanche white powder to distinguish it from black powder and it was also hoped that that would confuse well, everyone always focuses on German espionage, but actually the French were just as worried about British espionage. In fact, more worried about British espionage. Because as a, tr as a rule, the French realised that German espionage, they tended to catch because it was kind of... Um, how do I put this? Badly run. Whereas British espionage in France had a long-running history of disturbingly successful... Dating back from the Napoleonic Wars onwards, the British have been disturbingly good at penetrating their French uh, neighbours. The French have also been, tried to be quite as good at penetrating Britain. They've had slightly less success. Again, this is possibly due to the fact that we have a very weird sense of humour. The amount of French spies who seem to be caught because they don't. They, they Historically, if you look at some of the cases where they got caught and some of the historical accounts, it seems to be because they don't, under, they don't get the same jokes. And that makes people think they're weird because they're not laughing in the right places. And that causes people to look into them and then they catch them. And it, it, it's, it's one of those things, it's a long running, it's so often it seems to be the case that that's what happens. It's almost a farce in British history of espionage and counter espionage that it's, that person doesn't laugh in the right places. Hmm. A bit weird. Yeah. Should probably check him out. Yeah, and oh yeah, that's a turning British people. If you can do that, that's what the Soviets focused on, and that actually they learned from the French and Germans errors, and they concentrated on going into universities and turning people to communism, etc., and making them ideological. But they were still British, of course, so they would laugh in the right places, so they get through. It. The, the history of dealing with Franco-German spies and finding them out quite so easily probably gave Britain a full sense of security. And then we have Pascal. Oh, name for a mathematician. So this, of course, is going to be some logical service, isn't it? Ay, oh, caramba, no. As mentioned, she was in East Asian waters are along with uh, during the sort of Box Rebellion and part of a force of roughly nine cruisers, including Pascal and Descartes. She was there till 1902, but when fighting was over in, J in China, the force was reduced. And by 1903, it included the armor cruiser Montcalm, the Chateau Renault and Burgard, which were both protected cruisers and, of course, Pascal. 
She actually joined a naval review in April of 1903 for the uh, Japanese Emperor time at Meiji in Kobe, Japan. This is the kind of interesting thing of what's going on here. The British send HMS Glory, a uh, pre dreadnought battleship, and the protected cruiser Blenheim. The Pascal is sent by the French. The Germans send a protected cruiser, the Hansa. The Italians a protected cruiser, the Calabria. And the Russians a protected cruiser, the Escold. So, who's trying to make a statement here of who can be the, Ita the Japanese's best friends? We often find the world interesting when we look at the sort of the Anglo-Japanese alliance and where it comes from. That's a long-running thing, and the British go the extra mile to get that alliance. Because they're looking at all those protected cruisers out there, and remember the British, the wording of the alliance is any combination of powers. It's useful for the British to have an X factor. And the Japanese are an X factor in the Far East. By 1904, she's in poor condition, having been in the Far East for pretty much five years with only the limited French facilities to support her because the French national pride meant they weren't going to make use of the British or other facilities available. The Japanese had actually offered the help as well. Um, this means that she was unable to steam really faster than, well, there are some reports which say 16 to 18 knots, but when you start to look in the logs you find she rarely steaming more than 10 knots. Sometimes 11 knots, very, she has, she has a, she can do a top speed of 16 knots, but not for long and not without making the engines sound like they're about to explode. In fact, to the extent that the engine room crew are, mm, how do I put this politely, really not keen to be anywhere near the engines. If you if you want to run them at 16 knots, they're going to make it remote controlled, then you're going to be the one doing the remote control for them shouting instructions from behind a light, nice thick piece of steel. If they can find a thick enough piece of steel, preferably on another ship far away. <laughs> oh, I've got to get that stabilized camera. Um, every time I laugh, it jiggles. <laughs> I have the most interactive camera set up known to mankind. I laugh, it jiggles with me. <laughs> Sorry, it's making me laugh more. <laughs> so unprofessional. I do apologize. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I don't know. However, the Russo Japanese War breaks out, and so she becomes part of the neutral ships observing the Battle of Shimulko, Shimulpo Bay, and she assists in rescue efforts. She sends boats out to help look for the survivors of the Varag and the Cosettes, and evacuates them to Saigon in French Indochina. She returns to France in 1905. They decide they're going to do a major overhaul. They determine that the work will be completed in, in 1906. But they've also decided that by that point, the military value is a nice phrase of the reconditioned Pascal would be pointless. There are phrases which go around like mediocre. Honestly, if it was written in English, the phrase would be used with, This vessel, uh, if it was written by the British, it would be a phrase like, This vessel, whilst offering ample opportunity for engineering experience and skills development in reconditioning and service, would probably not be able to fulfill any viable function in our current role so would have to be looked at for other support and auxiliary duties. Mm -hmm. In other words, why are we polishing a... Mm. So, she's then struck from the register. 
along with several older vessels, so as the Admiral Bordin, the Magneta, and the Milan, and um, yeah, she's dismantled in La Seine Samaire in 1912. And she's the one we have pictures of. No one. Oh well. So, the Descartes class. What are they? Pointless? Useful? Sexy. Honestly, they're not bad ships. But, like all French cruisers at the time, they are individuals. And this is what really limits French force generation. They do not have the force generation they need. And they can't generate the force they need from the structure they have. And I'm not sure if you can hear him, but the tra uh, the assistant fluffy research assistant is currently agreeing with me most vocally on the French Navy at this point. He feels what they lack is corky ships. Again, if you watch the Apollo class video, you'll know what I'm meaning. I would say what the French are lacking is a unifying factor. And that's also something which always interests me with the Juno Col, because one of the reasons I think the French Navy gets quite so wrapped up in a new school is it does provide a unifying factor. It's kind of weird when we look at certain navies. The ones which tend to do well are the ones which do have something which unifies their design and construction operational philosophies. The German one has this factor of technical excellence. Everything, it sort of unifies their entire armed forces, technically will be spectacular excellence, technical excellence. Austro-Hungarian, it's nation building. They are building a nation. You look, only you have to look at the multilingual nature and of their command structures and of their officers and their needs to have it be multilingual. To know what they are trying to build is they are trying to build a one nation, one fleet. And it's the fleet is the melting pot that's trying to hold the nation together. That's what they're trying to use their navy. That's, and that that's, can be seen in their ship design. The Americans, they are forging a new nation. They are forging their status and all their, their final results. And you can see this in their ships because they're big, they're brash, they've got to be symbols. As much as they, and their crews have got to be stand up and be symbols, as much as they have got to be ships. The Royal Navy has its tradition. It's sort of, there are discussions about whether officers made the right choice or not, and honestly, I'm, I think in terms of the Battle of Cornell, I'm probably going to have to do more of a video on it, because it's very easy to start going, well, you know, the officer, they should have the moral, lack of moral courage or this, because they should have done this, that, and the other. And you go, you're not really thinking about a scenario at a time, you're applying your own knowledge. But as far as well, Coronel knew, Craddock fought, fought and an intelligence suggested, like Von Spade intelligence suggested, they were going to engage a single ship. And he took his whole force with him. Now, we can argue about whether or not taking Antranto was a sensible thing, because if he hadn't had her, he could have run. But having her with, uh, having her with him was taking his full force to engage a single ship. He bumps into the Holobon space fleet, which he doesn't know is out there, but he thinks from intelligence that it's just one ship coming his way, and the rest are probably further away. So he thinks he's going to be engaging Von space scouting element, which he thinks if he takes out, he's going to buy him time. It's... There's no way he could not go and engage that ship with those reports because that's what you expect of a Royal Navy officer to go and engage the enemy. 
and that's effective in their design. But the trouble is for the Juno Col, and the reason why it doesn't become the unifying factor for the French that the British have with their sort of tradition and their mental understanding of what their navy is supposed to do, they're supposed to go and fight the enemy, they're supposed to take control of the sea, and everything's supposed to be structured around doing that task, and anything that distracts from that task is therefore wrong. Or the Americans building a nation on the Spanish preserving an empire until actually they lose the empire to the Americans. Uh, all these things, why does the Juno Cole not work for the French Navy? Because at the same point they are this nation state which is this global power and empire and they need to have those capital ships because you need to have the presence. It's all right saying, well in theory, according to my thought, according to my thinking, these ships will do this and therefore your ship doesn't matter. Doesn't matter in peacetime. In wartime, you might well win it and you might look great. But in peacetime, what matters is when you're doing diplomacy, the British turn up with HMS Glory and a protected cruiser. And let's be honest, the Blenheims of Blake class and Glory is a Canopus class. They are not exactly small and they do not exactly look bad in that period. The British are turning up with capable units and you're turning up with this. You can start arguing all you want on paper. Oh, no, no, our fleet can take them. But it doesn't look like it in peacetime. When you are shaping potential conflict, when you are shaping the likelihood of conflict, when you're managing the risk of conflict and trying to prevent but also minimize any conflict that breaks out, size and status of the ship matters. It does. And that's the problem with Junicol. Junicol is at its heart a war fighting theory. Not a very good one, because as I said, it, it is also a logical fallacy, in that it presumes your opponent is not going to adapt in any way, shape, or form. But it's also bad at peacetime. And there are good points. This is the thing. This is the trouble with Junicol. There are some points in there which are actually really good ideas. And you can tell they are because people like Fisher, etc., who... Fisher is often put as this great insightful person. Actually, no. What he is is very good at is looking out at reading out other people and reading the ideas they have and actually turning into something practical that you can implement. And he does. Shamelessly. The entire flotilla defense doctrine and flotilla doctrine that he comes up with is straight out the Juno Col. The thing is, though, it's grouped into an entire wider fleet strategy of what every component also is doing around it. And it works. But again, the British have that tradition and they have the infrastructure. And as I mentioned earlier, they had the Department of Naval Constructors who will turn up and box your ears if you start doing funny things with their ships. And I mean literally box your ears. Right, here's what we've got coming up. Ooh, so many things. You should have had the spell of class. Although I'm going to be re-recording that again after this video. <laughs> so, yeah, life happens. Um, question for you all. A question for you all after this is... I, of course, spend a lot of my time talking about the Juno Cole. And I have done an entire video on the Kantai Kessel. I'd like to hear what other doctrines you've heard about and what you think about them. Because that's potentially going to be part of the year of design technology is going to be going through to the various doctrines. And whereas with, uh, when I'm thinking about this, I'm sort of going, well, I need to have some idea what my audience and viewership might already be familiar with and what no one is familiar with so it's sort of a case of 
I want to know where my starting point can be. And I can do that easily with students because I can set them a test <laughs> and just go do this. I can't do that easily with view uh, viewers. And that feels bad to me, but I think it'd be an interesting part of the year of design technology to actually look at the uh, the concepts and operational doctrines behind them. But I want to know what my sort of baseline of knowledge I'm dealing with is before I push into it. So I know if I... I'm happy and will start right from the basics, and I'm being careful not to name any doctrines here, and go right the way through. But I want to know whether I, can, I have to do... Uh, where I sort of... What's going to come through is through your answers, etc. I'm going to hopefully work out whether I want to do period of doctrines, or I want to do individual doctrines. <sighs> Which is all more fun. Also, and I'm going to add this in, especially on the Christmas topics. Again, I've mentioned this in a few videos. It's part of my year. It seems to be at Christmas time. There is the bet between the twins going on. Yes, my mum and my aunt have their annual bet over whether or not I can get 10,000 subscribers by Christmas. It's roughly a thousand away. Now, before anyone says anything nasty about my aunt, please note this comes from a loving place, and my family make family familiar bets like this like we breathe, okay? It's, it's something we do, so please don't consider anything negative about it. Um, I think I also give an example of my sister and my uncle. There are cousin bets going on about this. There are Lego kits being waged, chocolates, mostly baked goods, bottles of iron brew. Those are the things which are waged on various things. It's, 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 it's part of our family, okay? I love them dearly, and honestly, I can never complain about these bets because I win a lot of them. But saying that, my mother would really like to win this year, so please, if you enjoy watching my videos, I'm asking, not for me, I'm asking so that my mother can win, and I have now checked out on this, I wasn't quite sure yesterday, but I had a discussion with her this morning before I started recording, and found out that no, my aunt is not producing baked goods, that's what my mum has to produce for my aunt, if um, she loses, no, my aunt has to supply my mum with apparently a whole load of... Um, Very fancy bath stuffs, I think, is basically. Anyway. Which my aunt probably would do anyway, even without the bet. Honestly, I, I have no understanding, really, of this scope of this bet. But th that's what's going on. So, um, yes, if you like the channel and you would like my mum to win, that's what I'm asking for. I, I am not... Uh, you can watch many of my videos. I never do the subscribe, share, like fun uh, thing, really. I, I do sometimes mention the share and liking things because they help the algorithm spread out to more people. But honestly, this becomes more of a feature as the year goes on towards the end of the year because the 25th of December is coming up and because I know that vote is... Uh, well, not vote, that, that um, contest, that bet is in play. So please, help a guy out. Or rather, help my mum out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> oh, every year this makes me feel bad. <laughs> Have fun.